Well, hello everyone. I think it's probably time we can take this down. Hi, how is everybody doing? I'm very happy to be back here with the joy of game mastering. Sorry I've been away so long. It has been a uh, August, September, and November were pretty wild. So uh, I'm glad that I'm back here chatting with you all now. We're going to sort of pick up where we left off. We were talking about world building the last time we were together. And during my absence, I got to thinking, wouldn't it be fun if we made a superhero setting together? Just to have a demonstration of some of these high concept world building um, applications. So today we're going to be doing basically any time that you create a new setting for a role playing game, you can start very micro, start at the very bare minimum of where the heroes are going to be exploring the sort of adventure space that they'll be occupying. That's very popular to do for fantasy role playing games because you don't necessarily have to worry so much about, you know, what is the rest of the world like? But when it comes to superheroes, I find it's best to start from the top down because your players are going to have a lot of questions that are big picture questions. Things like, how many other superheroes are there? Does the government know about us? Does, does regular society know about us? Is you know Where do powers come from? These are all big picture questions that I think behoove you to begin thinking about as we work our way down. So today's going to be very much uh, working together to answer some of these big picture questions. And we're going to be building this world over the course of a few, uh, few episodes of the Joy of Game Mastering as we're going our way through. We'll start with sort of the world building stuff. Then we'll get into maybe making a campaign together and then getting down to the minutia of how to make adventures together. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, please feel free to sit down, hang out with me, ask any questions that you have in the chat, and we'll get into it. Um, Pope Brandon Brownson, thank you for being here. Dominic, thank you for being able to catch up. And Drama Dork, hello. I hope everybody is having a great Tuesday. I uh, slipped on the ice walking the dogs last night, so I am... Uh, I'm having an awesome day. <laughs> uh, so yeah, today we are starting with the highbrow stuff, and I will go and share my my Google Doc with you all. After I find a place for my face to go. Mm, over here on the left is good with me. So we present share screen. Grab a Chrome tab. And I'll make sure our uh, video is here and good to go. Oh, you're technically working? That's exciting. Don't give them more than they're worth, drama dork. Is that legible for you all? Let me know. I can't really tell how easy that is to read on my screen. So if you're out there, please let me know. Dominic says, for superheroes, I usually try to think about whether aliens or magic serves aspects of the world because those are two big ones. Yes, that's not the first question we're going to get into. Could be a touch bigger. Well, we'll see if I can make it a touch bigger. I don't know if I'm going to be able to, but we'll do our best. It's slow because nobody wants to work this close to Christmas. That makes sense. Hmm. How do I get rid of some of these? It says I've got too many custom. Uh, pump the font size up a little bit. Yeah, I'll do that. See if that helps. Pop it up to 20, see if that makes it easier to read from far away. Yeah, that looks like it's working. Cool. So when I'm designing a new superhero world, I tend to start with the... Um... Oh, that made it full screen and took my face away. <laughs> All right, that seemed to help. Cool. So one of the things that I start with is genre. When I'm thinking of... 
the superhero world I want to build because that's going to cascade into everything else that we're doing. So superhero genres, you know, the classic, the four big ones. If there's another one that you guys are thinking about, please let me know. But the big ones in my mind are the golden age, which is sort of the birthplace of comic books, early 1940s, early 1930s, big heroes, big powers dealing with larger than life issues, uh, typically associated with World War II. So we're talking Captain America when he's punching Hitler on the cover, Superman when he's actually beating up corrupt landlords and being helpful to society in a way that he should he should start doing again. Uh, yeah, talking about sort of patriotic, sort of big powers, uh, very little moral ambiguity. There are good guys, there are bad guys. Silver Age is a little bit after that in the 60s and 70s, uh, thinking about, again, larger than life powers, but it's a little more silly than the Golden Age. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, flashy costumes, big code names, the revival of some characters from the Golden Age with new iterations of themselves, thinking like going to Barry Allen Flash from Jake Eric Flash and Hal Jordan Green Lantern from Alan Scott, sort of getting into all of that. Again, still very good versus evil, uh, but with some of that fun psychedelic influence thrown in. I like the Silver Age a lot. Iron Age is sort of 80s, 90s, big pouches, big guns, lots of bullets, very uh, big sort of knee-jerk reaction to the comic books that were kids from the uh, 70s and before. Uh, lots of realism, lots of big stakes, moral ambiguity, sort of down in the dirt, in the mud, sort of inspired by books like Watchmen or Frank Miller's take on Batman, uh, The Punisher, Spawn, all those fun. Uh, Wolverine also really hit his heyday in this time period. And then there's the Modern Age, which is my favorite because it takes some of that gritty realism from the Iron Age and brings us back into sort of optimistic superheroes. So there are still larger than life powers, but there are real problems that need to be addressed and they don't sweep a lot of the societal problems under the rug that you tend to find. So those are the four that I tend to think of when I think of uh, superhero genres. What are we feeling? What do we think is a good uh, place to start? I'm personally leaning in the direction of modern age just because that's sort of modern storytelling. I'd even argue that there is sort of an even newer genre that could be talked about, which is sort of that. I call it humans as water balloons, comics, uh, things like the boys, things like invincible, where it's almost like the deconstruction age where we've gotten to the point where everybody is sort of so media savvy about superheroes that we are beginning to find ways to really deconstruct that setting and uh, sort of make commentary that way. So I'll even add that in as a potential, I'll call it the deconstruction age. I like the modern age, says Rebel Moose, though I'm biased and I'm working on a modern age setting for a campaign. I think it's a great setting. You know, I, um, my, the first comics I ever collected were the New 52 for DC because that was a great onboarding point for me. And I hadn't yet realized that comic books were just a continual source of uh, rebirth. <laughs> uh, Pope says, I mean, when you describe the deconstruction and age like that, I'm interested to toy around with it. You know, it's, it's, it's cool. I, um, you know, I know it's not for everyone, uh, but I've been really enjoying sort of, uh, I, I really enjoy that type of storytelling, sort of that subversion of expectations. The, you know, we could take these icons, these almost mythological figures that we've been building since the 1930s and really put them on, twist them on their heads and really see what those characters say about us as a society today. And I say that while realizing that Superman is my favorite superhero and I really hate the Superman is evil trope um, just because I think I think fundamentally it misunderstands who superhero is. Regarding Valiant, says Tempo, could it be slotted into either the bronze, silver, gold, or dark ages of superhero comics? I would say with Valiant specifically, it's very bronze and dark and modern age. 
uh, depending on where you sort of ping in Valiant's history since the 90s. Uh, the stuff that we're working on, we're working from 2012 forward. So a lot of that is a very modern age with sort of a bent toward the deconstruction stuff that I've been talking about. Um, you know, it's a setting that has a lot of moral ambiguity. There's a lot of, there are not a lot of clear cut, this person is good, this person is evil characters in that setting, which is one of the things that I find fascinating about it. And I've had a lot of fun from a game master perspective, trying to figure out how to encourage that kind of gameplay and how to reward that gameplay. Because I think fundamentally one of my game design philosophies is the thing that makes sense thematically should be the correct choice to make from a mechanics point of view. So we've got to vote for modern age. We've got to vote for deconstruction age. What's everybody else feeling? Or do we want to think about that and move on to the next point? Uh, the next point being the origin of powers in the setting. That's what Dominic was talking about earlier, as in where do superpowers come from in the setting? You know, we offer a few options in the Mutants and Masterminds Game Master's Guide. Uh, and these are sort of the questions I like to ask. Are the superpowers alien in nature? Are they magical in nature? Are they a mutation or a metahuman situation? Basically biological powers. Is it super technology run amok? Are there gods who can empower people? Similar to like Shazam in the DC Comics universe or even Wonder Woman or Thor uh, from Marvel. Uh, is it a training setting where there aren't really superpowers, but the people who are superheroes are sort of expertly trained? They're sort of like the Batman type, uh, leaning into the Defenders, characters like that who are very street level uh, with very minimal superpowers. Or is it a mix? Is it a grab bag type of setting? And if it is a mixed type of setting, which of these options exist as possibilities? You know, Earth Prime is definitely a mixed bag of origins, and pretty much all of these exist as options in Earth Prime. Uh, My Titan City setting is also a mixed bag, and most of these options exist. Uh, there's aliens, there's magic, there's gods, there is super technology, and there are a few trained superheroes running around. There's not so many that are biological in nature. They're usually influenced by something else. Which one is more morally ambiguous, Valiant or Marvel? Uh, Tempo, I'd definitely say Valiant is more morally ambiguous than Marvel. Um, Marvel has been moving that direction a little bit, but Valiant is sort of still ahead of them, I would say, in terms of moral. And not to say that it's a race to see who could be the most morally ambiguous. There is definitely room in the world for stories that are good versus evil without muddying the lines between the two of those. I think it would be a fun challenge for the world that we're building to have one origin. So if we're thinking, you know, I think the Arrowverse did this very well in the early days, uh, whereas Supergirl, all of her problems were alien in nature because she was an alien superhero. And there wasn't so many magic or mutation villains running around in those early seasons. The Flash was all about stopping metahumans in those early seasons, and Arrow did a lot of dealing with sort of the training style villains. So I liked that they were sort of segmented in that way, but there were options for those lines to bleed over, especially as the series began to cross over more, and you got into things like Legends of Tomorrow, where it was very much everything is on the table. But I think it would be a fun challenge to try and design a setting that is specifically one type of power. You know, Marvel also does something like that where X-Men stories tend to be mutant-based issues. Pope says, I had an idea, that uh, idea I played with that is every superpower is somehow tied back to one of 42 elements, so it's all tied to magic in a way. Which uh, elements? You th are you thinking like elements on the periodic table, or are you thinking like earth, wind, fire, water, September, all of that fun jazz? And I'll put that in as uh, 42 elements, possibly magic. Because that is our first uh, 
Every power is tied back to a song from Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah, definitely. You know, the, you, we're joking, but that could be a fun, like, if we built the Motown verse. Like, it doesn't just have to be Earth, Wind, and Fire, but every every power is tied to a song from that era. You know, these are the kinds of things that you can really lean into in a superhero setting. And even if you don't tell your players that that's what you're doing, it's a fun way to build continuity. Like if we wanted to do songs related to Earth, Wind, and Fire, that would be a little abstract, I think, because not a lot of their songs are uh, not a lot of their songs are very uh, on the head. Like we know what they're gonna do. Like you could definitely do. I don't even know what you would do for September. That uh, September almost feels like autumn end of summer so you could be looking at sort of decay style powers but the song itself is very festive and dancey so it could also be something like influencing mobs of people to do various things that you want them to do um the shining star could be the sort of paragon style character who flies around and shoots things with star beams in the stone is easily a big earth-based character uh looking at yeah, just all, all those sorts of things. December could be a could be a uh, could be an ice power. Is gravy one of those elements? It could be. <laughs> I had a list of earth, fire, water that I was able to come up with. RC is referred to as the list of ridiculous, but what does he know? Yeah, what does he know? The universe based entirely on album artwork from heavy metal bands. I mean, that was that was a game. That was uh, what was the name of that? game jack black was the voice actor for it jack black metal video game brutal legend that's what it was a one shot where every character represents a different genre of music gotta jot this down on my awful one shots i'll eventually run list i don't think it's a bad idea rebel moose you know uh that can be a league of super villains that are all music based uh I feel like I feel like I would want to come up with something a little bit more than just giving them a code name that that is the genre of music they represent. So like, I hate to say this, but country cowboy, uh, it's got to be alliterative, right? It's got to be disco diva, country cowboy, metal mayhem. Uh... Oh man. Opera Outlaw. There we go. That's five right there. We've joked around for a while, so in the interest of moving forward, I say you choose the origin of powers. Blast beat to shred to the occasion. I'm here for it. A team all based on classic books. I think we're going to go with the 42 elements uh, option that Brandon proposed, and I think we should come up with a couple of those elements now while we're thinking about it. So... Diving into that, we're going to highlight this as the option we want to go with, and we'll we'll delete these other ones because I I'll remember if we need to come back to them. I think, in the interest of moving on, we'll go with modern age or deconstruction age. Those ages are very similar, so we could sort of blend the two of them. Forty-two elements, possibly magic. So we should decide if that is indeed magical in nature. Don't you give me that. Come on. No, I don't want letters. I want numbers. <sighs> okay, fine. Fine. All right. So looking at uh, the, e the easy ones are earth, wind, fire, or earth, air, water, uh, fire, Getting into what? What are we thinking? Fire, lightning, ice, esoteric elements like emotion, soul, and perception. Yeah, I think we should get a little sort of a, a esoteric about this. Uh, lightning, soul. Eh, we'll avoid soul for now. Emotion, perception. You said. No, I want the. There we go. Okay. And the numbers will help because there's 42 of these things. 
How did you come up with the number 42, Brandon? We can get into things like metal. Someone look up the types in Pokemon. Yeah, dark, light. Those are all good. We can also look up the energy controller subtype in uh, the Deluxe Heroes Handbook because that's going to have a lot of overlap here. We're going to have a lot of characters who are in that particular archetype. Character archetypes, energy controllers on page 38 of the Deluxe Heroes Handbook. Oh, but that's not the character creation version. That's just the, if you want to hand somebody one to play. Here we go. We're looking at page 66 in the Deluxe Heroes Handbook. So we're looking at powers. Uh, this has a list of cold, cosmic, darkness, electrical, fire, hellfire, light, magnetic, plasma, sonic, vibration. And that's tw that's not 20. It's a little bit less than 20. But I like the idea of sonic, uh, magnetic. I guess that sort of ties into metal. I'll swap metal out for magnetic. Plasma, not plasma, vibrations. I guess vibration is a little bit different than sonic as well. Radiation powers. Oh, yeah, 42 is the meaning of life. You're right. Plant, stone, sand, gravity, magma, ash, plasma, vapor, blood, ordered knowledge, solar, lunar. Well, we're going to chuck radiation on the list for sure because that's always fun to do. Uh, plants I like. We'll go with. I like gravity a lot. Just sort of dealing with natural forces. I think gravity also implies time. We want to have time controllers. Not necessarily time travelers, but time controllers could be interesting. That's something else we'll have to talk about getting into. Uh, does time travel exist in our world? Uh, solar... Solar feels like it might fall into cosmic, maybe. So we'll just call cosmic kind of space dust star powers. But I'd also like to ask, add singularity. I guess singularity is kind of in gravity. Actually, now that I think about it. Uh, what do we got? Solar and lunar. I guess having differences between the moon and the sun could be fun. I'll put solar and lunar in. I think there's something there. Knowledge. I like that a lot. Um, and the question becomes, as we're building these options, are the is there one avatar for each one of these options, or is this a power like is this a power grading system that can apply to many characters? Death, antimatter, chi, vapor. I like the idea of life and death. They almost feel like they're going to be sort of the top level issues. I feel like stone and sand are covered by earth. I'd say that many characters, but I love my big rosters. 42 is a big roster of superheroes, to be clear. It's just that's the question of does that mean there are 42 superpowered people in the world out of the 8 billion people who live here? Or is there more? Which is one of the questions we'll be talking about in just a moment. Our next topic is superhero population. Does anybody else have ideas for uh, what's well, cosmic energy? You'll know when you see it. It'll look like it's drawn by Jack Kirby. <laughs> uh, probability also feels like a good uh, element for this. If we're getting into elements, we can get, even get into something like transmutation. So somebody who's able to change one element from the others. Uh, each continent has 42 superheroes. That's a pretty cool idea. Rebel Moose, what would make that happen? Alchemy. Alchemy feels like it might fall under transmutation, but we'll see. We need 15 more. 
vapor. Vapor fuel, I guess vapor is like vaporized water rather than air. So it's it's kind of a mix between two. So I'm happy to throw that in there. Uh, blood feels like a natural super villain, but it could also be a fun superhero. I mean, I saw Gen B. I know the blood powers can be cool for heroes. I want to come up with a word for like stealing the power, like absorbing powers or negating powers. If there's an element for that, that would be a fun thing to add in, like transmutation and then nullification. But I don't know. Nullification feels like a. It feels more like an act than an element in my mind. I guess transmutation is too. What would make that happen? Plate tectonics, unleashing some ether. Void. I like void. Power negation. I'll put that in parentheses just so I know that that's what we were thinking for that. If the superhero has divine power, so they have to do rituals and uh, propitiate their deity like in RuneQuest to keep their powers. Um, that could be. Yeah. Um, I've definitely seen that work before. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> ether giving people powers feels a little bit like the Inhumans, right? Body, mind, and soul. Uh, we didn't have, we don't have any of those, I don't think. We have emotion and perception, but I think body, mind, and soul can be fun for sure. Ten more. I'm going into Infinity Stone levels of vague now, but you know, vague is better than specific in my mind. I mean, even fire is a very broad category. Earth is a very broad category. Imagination. We'll call that creation. Although I feel like life and death is probably the same as creation and destruction, but I guess not. I guess one is one could be for biological matter. One could be for inorganic matter. War could be a fun element to ever like looking at very big broad concepts we can go with an avatar of war uh, and do we want to call these the avatars of these elements or do we want to call uh, avatar i guess is very specific to element bending <laughs> so probably not creation would be like ruby <laughs> we need an avatar of peace yeah i like the opposing forces because if we can make opposing forces for each one, that means we could naturally have two teams. We could have four, we could have 21 heroes and 21 villains if we wanted to go for something like that. Is creation Ruby? Yes, creation is Ruby. Kinetic uh, poison. Okay, yeah, poison's good. And kinetic. Kinetic could easily be a speedster or it could be... Uh, could be somebody else who deals with the manipulation of elemental forces. Devas instead of avatars. What would be the opposite of gravy? Biscuits. Balance. Balance feels like it needs to be the secret 43rd element. Like that's sort of what's missing from everyone is balance. I feel like I feel like balance needs to be some kind of story element or something that can be added in at a later point. Balance as 40 as secret 43. I think balance is the thing that's missing from all of these. And that is the sort of, that's what they're striving for. So balance is either responsible for the creation of the avatars or the devas as has been suggested. And I like devas. When you cook the meat too dry. <laughs> Justice and law. I like justice and law. Or justice and injustice. I don't know. Justice and vengeance. <laughs> Since Batman's always talking about that. Justice and or order and chaos. We can go with order and chaos. 
and then we need two more. And I think we get. I think we can have some fun building. We'll get. Well, this won't be this episode, but we'll get into, um, sort of what is the you know what are each of these devas? I'm gonna put devas in code named devas question mark for now. We did get water. Progress could be cool. I, I was thinking um I was thinking creation might be a fun uh super scientist, but progress could definitely be could definitely be fun for that. And then what's the opposite of progress? Animal. Yeah, I guess animal would be cool. Animal to go the opposite of plant. And then one more. Glamour and something opposite to that. Glamour and... Plainness. <laughs> we'll call animal beast. Because I, I think that's the, de the beast deva, the kinetic deva, the order deva. Entropy. We have death and destruction. I feel like entropy is probably covered in that. I think. Because I was thinking entropy as well, but then I realized we had I realized we had uh, death and destruction already. Glamour and simplicity. Hmm. Glamour and grime. I, I like glamour and grime because they're, they start with the same letter. And it's very much... I, don't know, I almost feel like simplicity is the balance between glamour and grime. I do like glamour though a lot. Sorry, there's cars using the road outside and the dog doesn't like that. I'm going to drop perception, I think, and put in glamour and grime. And that'll give us our 42 which will be our, our secrets at 43. Gravy. Oh, I forgot that that posts everywhere. <laughs> Glamour and gravy. Do we were all right. I'm going to put grime, but I'm going to put gravy in parentheses because that's how I feel about gravy. <laughs> So we have our origins of powers. We have our genre that we're going to be aiming for. So that's two very big. And we've really we've listed out the powers that we're going to be dealing with. So now we get into some of the big society questions. Things like how big is the superhero population? Is their population secret or public? Are they common, uncommon, or rare? What is the relationship with government and law enforcement? So I think we've sort of answered that they're rare. That's what we've come up with because there are 42, either 42 in the whole world or 42 per continent. So I like the idea of 42 in the whole world personally, just because that is, you know, that's very minutia, but that also gives us an excuse to make these avatars very powerful. Like this could be a PL 13, a PL 14 game. If we're looking at something like using mutants and masterminds rules for it. You know they can be uh, they can be extremely powerful represent representations of these things. One from various countries. Mm. Then we get into the discussion of what country represent what represents which element, and that feels like that could be that could be a little fraught in my mind. Forty two globally makes sense. Plus aliens exist and they can have their own forty two. That go that would be a fun escalation of stakes for sure. Yeah, I'm okay with putting one I mean, you you almost want them to be localized in some kind of area, however, that way they can be drawn into conflict with one another. And we can have a group of we can have a group of player characters come together as as a team of superheroes. So having one per country is a cool concept, but I do think 
I think they need to have some clumped around so that there is an opportunity for them to come into conflict with one another or an opportunity to work with one another. So either it's one per country, but a group of countries have come together and realized that their representative is there and they can be put into a, an international team to go out and respond to these issues. But then again, you sort of get into the, yeah. Or maybe there's like 42 PL12s, but the rest of the superpopulation is like PL8-ish. Yeah, I guess I do like the idea of the Davis being able to imbue some of their power to underlings and things like that. Because that also gives variety for... That also gives variety for stories that we can tell. Like if there are the options to have quote unquote minions, you can you can vary how many villains you're gonna run into in a given scene. You don't necessarily have to just have you don't necessarily have to just have we go find this guy, we beat this guy up as the only story option. Yeah, I agree, Rebel Moose. One per element also avoids the two players have the same element issue. Yeah. And, and you're right, it's not an issue, but it is an obstacle to making each player feel like they have something specific to do on the team. Yeah, I almost... Uh, and I mentioned the International League earlier, but I really like the idea of this being a secret thing. Like, all of these people, like, maybe there is... Maybe there's somebody, like, the Avatar of Order knows what's going on, and it goes out looking for avatars to add to a team but it's not a government sanctioned thing. It's sort of this guy or this, this person goes out and finds people to bring together as almost like a Nick Fury type because their driving force is to bring order to the situation. But it winds up being a sort of like the Jedi think bringing balance to the force means all the dark goes away. Not it will be even. <laughs> yeah. I think our first campaign arc is probably I like the idea of order and chaos being NPCs, but the order could also be a PC who happens to be the team leader. And the first story arc is between the forces of order and the forces of chaos because they think that that's they think that's the, what's going on. Yeah, I like underground super war too. So I'm going to say secret. We're going to say rare. Uh, I like the idea of the forty-two. PL 12 to 14 devas who can imbue underlings with aspects of their power. And having those aspects of their power give you the opportunity to have like an avatar of magma or an avatar of ash. Like if the fire deva imbues a group of people, they can all be different forms of fire. And those underlings are the PL uh, 6 to 10 variety. And I do like the idea of the PCs being one of the 42 PL 12 to 14 Davis. Uh, in my mind, temporary, it's uh, generic chaos rather than chaos from Warhammer Fantasy. Uh, inspired by is kind of cool, though. Um, it's actually the portal of KO, the cute little guys from the Sonic the Hedgehog universe. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the chaos could be sort of inspired by Warhammer Chaos in that it's in my mind, it's generic and it seeks to provide instability, almost almost like anarchy is more what I'm thinking. But Warhammer Chaos is very much, it corrupts everything around it and drives it into clearly evil. If we're looking at a modern age story, I would say that that's the sort of chaos we're looking at, where the chaos is clearly evil. But if we're looking at deconstruction age, I would say that we're looking at chaos and order being a little more nuanced where the extreme of order is fascism. It is complete separation of people from their personal liberties in the name of providing structure and entirely robbing everybody of their free will. And the extreme of chaos is that corrupting influence where 
even the physical matter of the universe begins to break down because there's no structure in there's no there's not even structure to the laws of physics anymore is what chaos wants and i think that also makes them a great first a great first story arc to deal with because if if order is an npc like a nick fury style character who's bringing all these people together it can be revealed that order is order wants initially what's best for everyone in order's own mind um but the heroes who are working for order can slowly be pushed into doing more and more extreme activities in the name of order rather than in the name of good i think there's i don't like the alignment chart very much but i do like that lawful and good are not together like the lawful to chaos scale and the good to evil scale are not entirely bound together i like that about that but I don't like it as an excuse for bad role playing, if that makes sense. <laughs> the extreme of order and chaos is the whole point of sin, of some Shin Megami Tensei games. That's out. I don't think I've ever played a Shin Shin Megami game. Can it be a chaos that's good versus order's evil, like a red horned hero fights against a tyrannical white church? Yeah, we can. I mean, we can also go with you, and this is something that could come up in session zero. You know, we're we're designing a world, but we're not necessarily designing a story. One of the goals in game design is to create a sandbox and to provide tools for game masters to take and then build into something of their own. You know, it's sort of the extreme version of when I tell game masters, don't fall too in love with your story. What we want to do is provide a world state that is that has interesting opportunities for all sorts of games to take place. So the player characters could definitely be working for the avatar of chaos instead of the avatar of order. And you can present either extreme as being the problem or they could work for neither. And they could realize before everybody else that balance might be the goal. And they could be caught in between the forces of chaos and the forces of order, trying to make everybody chill the hell out. You know, there are a lot of great stories that we can tell in this setting already as we're thinking about as we're thinking about who these avatars are, what they represent. Um, we mentioned that it's a secret government, that's a secret organization. So uh, the relationship with government is at least um, no official relationship. Some of the avatars will naturally gravitate towards government and law enforcement. So the avatar of justice, the avatar of order, they might have positions in these organizations without those organizations having an official idea about how to interact with superpowered beings. Uh, and then the government slash police respond to uh, vigilante slash superpowered threats as we would expect them to in our world. So we'll sort of go from there and we'll build off of that. Here's a good question. Are the champions chosen via you embody my ideals, I give you my power, or is it totally random? The, um, the underlings we know are chosen by the devas and given power, but where do the devas get their power from? We have to ask, are these elements, do these elements have a representative of their own that sort of is like the god of that element or whatever, who, who bestows power upon the champions? Or is it almost a, is it this person so broadly represents that idea that the psychics, the, sci the sort of psionic energy of the universe coalesces that into them and they just have that ability one day? Because the underlings are chosen, I like the devas being random. I do too. I like I like that it puts the devas at the top of the food chain, basically. The Zero Striker Gun Volt shows how adepts or superpowered people are regulated and even impressed in how they react to that. Yeah. Yeah, there are tons of great stories about uh, the government getting involved and deciding that superpowers are bad. Or, <laughs> or uh, we need to be registered or we need to be completely under control. 
or one of the things I think the boys does really well is they late late stage capitalism is uh <laughs> is who's responsible for controlling the super the superheroes and the supervillains. The idea of the devas being randomized gives us a chance to play with nature versus nurture too. Yeah. Yeah, I think the devas are random. Not necessarily random, but there is something about them that draws that energy into them from the universe itself rather than being chosen. Almost like they are they are sort of singularities for that particular element. Here's the question. So as we move out of society, we move into setting. So we have an option here. Do we want to set our game in an alternate Earth? So similar to like Marvel or DC, where the countries we recognize, they might have names that are a little bit different, like Bialia or Sokovia. But we know that that's like a vaguely Middle Eastern country. That's a vaguely Eastern European country. Gotham City is sort of Chicago. Metropolis is sort of New York, sort of looking at that. Or do we want to put this in a wholly unique world that is completely divorced from our idea of Earth? So its own continents, its own cities, all that fun stuff. Yeah, just like mutants and X-Men. The mutants are very much an allegory for... Uh, an allegory for persecution by the majority. I kind of like the idea of us having a unique world for this, because that's also sort of different than what we traditionally do with superhero games. Traditionally, it is an Earth-like world. Dominic thinks, I think, being set on our Earth works. And there's benefits for both. I mean, setting something on an alternate Earth shortens the amount of short... It get, provides shorthand for your players to know what's going on. Like they know, they know what America is. They know what a city is. They know, you know, we know how vaguely how many people live here. We know there are oceans. We know the continents. We know what to expect sort of from a cultural perspective. And that is less exposition you have to deliver to them. The benefits of setting something on, on an alternate earth is that they have a built-in series of knowledge that you can pull from without having to explain more information. And that's a drawback for unique worlds. A unique world, one of the issues is you have to explain the normal to everyone. So the benefit of a unique world is you don't have as much baggage. Um, you know, people have built-in preconceptions about what our world is like. They have built-in preconceptions about people, about societies, and with a unique world, you can clear that slate and you can work from nothing to build a story that is completely yours. Yeah, I'd say House of M. I think House of M is still an alternate Earth storyline, right? Like Wanda got rid of all the mutants. Is that when Wanda got rid of all the mutants? I think so. I haven't read House of M in a little while. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. You're saying the House of M is like the uh, is like Davis of altered history to the point where Earth is much less recognizable. I got. I got you. At tempo. Now. Now we're on the same wavelength like an alt earth alt history deal yo yeah that's definitely and that that ties into the next question of when did heroes emerge in the world because the further back these devas started appearing the more changes are going to be possible for the timeline and the more changes need to be considered for the timeline that's you know i sort of call this bright burn world building where if you <laughs> if you uh if you say that the world has had access to magic and monsters since the Middle Ages, why the hell is everything the same? How is there an America now? You you can't just hand wave that. Like, <laughs> if you decide that that humans have had access to magic for thousands of years and everything is still early two thousands LA, how? <laughs> That's why with a lot of alternate history. Traditionally, writers in alternate history pick one point of divergence and they move from that point forward to help with the world building. Like in Titan City, I decided that magic and monsters were revealed to the world in 1907. And 
that's not enough time to really change the events that lead up to World War One. But going into World War II, things are going to be a lot different. And going beyond that, things are going to be a lot, lot different. Just like to pull one idea, maybe the Irish had a Davis in their rank and wound up taking England over, or which changes all sorts of stuff. Yeah, things like that. Those are the things that you have to consider when you are when you are building a world uh, with when you're dealing with our world with magical concepts. I don't know. What do you guys think? If we are going to go with the real world, when did the Deva begin to appear? I sort of like the idea that the Deva sort of appeared vaguely 10 years ago. Or vaguely, or like now. That way we can, if we want to have an alternate Earth, we can play with the best of both worlds and have the Deva showing up now. So history is not changed, but... And we still have that shorthand, but going forward, we can change as much as we want. Or do they date back to, you know, if the Deva date back to a certain point in history for mankind, they're going to have a, uh, there's going to be an issue. <laughs> like, we're going to have to do a lot of thinking timeline wise. Like the idea of them showing up now as a big empowering event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like, that's, that's a good idea too. I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the Silver Storm. Uh, they also do that in Umbrella Academy very well, where, a bunch of superpowered babies were born on a specific day. Uh, sooner would be easier. Typically, I go for between the Civil War and World War One when I do alt history stuff, but that it is more of a commitment for sure. Because you have to, yeah. There are so many alternate history books that are built on faulty history that it's a lot to, it's a lot to unpack. I think we're going to go with. So we're going to go with alternate Earth for sure. And I'm going to say uh, heroes emerged at the beginning of the campaign. So modern day empowering event takes place that gives everyone powers at once. And uh, adventures start taking place one to three months after the event. As devas learn what they can do and begin, not begging, coming into conflict with one another. Do we think that there is a logic core? Uh, logic core, we've decided not that everyone is not powered. Then it becomes a matter of figuring out who else in the small town of 4,000 has simultaneously achieved superpowers and what their powers are and what their motives are. Yeah. Hello, Tim. How are you doing today? Thank you for joining us. Uh, logic core, we decided that uh, there are 42 people in the world who have superpowers, and each of those powers is tied to an element. Uh, and those elements are sort of sort of abstract like we have the basic ones we have uh, earth air water fire lightning emotion glamour magnetic dark light sonic plasma vibration radiation plant gravity time cosmic solar lunar knowledge life death probability transmutation void vapor blood body mind soul creation destruction war peace poison kinetic order chaos progress beast and grime with balance as a secret 43rd element, with balance being sort of the ultimate end goal of these elements appearing in the world. Godlike shows superheroes or talents fighting in World War II, helping the Allies fight the Axis. Yeah, definitely. Um, I personally love World Wars, the World Wars with superheroes. You should work out the general size of the event, like how much of the immediate area was affected. Recently developed powers also lets players incorporate into complications if they want their character to be uneasy slash unskilled with the use of powers. Definitely. Uh, God likes a role-playing game. Cool. Yeah, so I think 
Personally, I like the idea of this being a modern event. Simon is correct. We should work out the general size. And in my mind, it sort of envelops the entire planet, providing people with powers all across the world. Um, although, what do you guys think? Is there an area... Is there a specific area that you think would be more interesting to nail things down in? So I guess now we get to decide, do we want this to be an international game? Do we want to be, this to be a national game, uh, a tri-state area game? You know, and if it is a tri-state area, what does the rest of the world think about this group of people getting powers? Topeka, Kansas. <laughs> Yeah, wherever you guys think I am down. Having it localized in one area also opens up a lot of options for fun conspiracy theories, for sure. Single town slash city would really work as the backdrop for a secret empowered war. Yeah. My mind, my mind says make it a global thing, but my heart says it would be way more interesting to pop it in one city. I like the idea of international. It wasn't Marvel's new U? Wasn't its white event limited to the U.S.? I think that is the case with Marvel's uh, white event. We could always do the best of both worlds and make it an event that took place in somewhere that's not the United States if we want to have something really fun and unique. Cosmological, uh, kind of like the Rising Stars comic, cosmological event takes place. Number of kids around a small town in Illinois that were in utero during then during the event develop powers. What if it hits a few locations around the globe? Yeah, I think um, that's something we'll have to work out for sure. Be thinking about that as we're going in. I, I kind of want it to be, and, and that way we don't have to pigeonhole everybody into one or one place of origin. So if we want to have we want to pick like three places in the world that the what's a good number to divide 42 by seven, seven. That would be six locations if we wanted to divide it by seven and there could be seven devas in each of these locations. Or you have it in one locale for one arc and then another empowering event occurs elsewhere. Apple juice, it could be good to have the best of both worlds. David might be more concentrated in one area, but it affects those outside of it less densely. Oh, I love Tiger and Bunny, Tempo. Yeah, I think six locations. I like the idea of, yeah, seven people in six locations. Yeah, I think we're going to go with that. Or Fubar Basilisk says seven continents would be weird in Antarctica, though. Yeah, I think six locations. I think six locations across the world, one on each of the populated continents. And I do like the idea of the escalation being the number of empowered people it suddenly jumps from 42 to 84. Tim, the devas are the avatars of these elements. So who the player characters are. And who the main super, the main powered people are going to be. Uh, the main powered people are the Davis. They are the avatars of these elements. So the player characters will be this. Any allied heroes will be this. Any super villains that they run into will be this. But the Davis also have the ability to imbue certain certain people with aspects of the element that they're the avatar of. <sighs> Somehow it's already six oh one. So I'm going to mark down the six locations. Event takes place in six locations across the world. Imbuing seven people per area with powers. That also gives you your first story arc, basically, where your player characters are some of those seven people. And whoever is left, those are the first villains that they have to deal with in their immediate area. And then it can go up to the international level scale. So there is there is an escalation of power in this series already that we're dealing with. So starting them off with like four player characters up against three enemy devas. And those devas 
are imbuing people around town with aspects of their elements, you already have a built-in first story arc of taking down the lieutenants and the three devas in your area. So think about that. Uh, we didn't say that the event was contagious. Um, I think we keep it uncontagious just for the sake of keeping it at the 42 until we want to escalate and double the amount of people. And the f the doubling of the amount of people makes me think that there is some there is somebody in control of when this is happening. So those are the questions that we're going to figure out in our next recording of the Joy of Game Mastering. Um, so. Yeah, I, I'm glad that we're back to this. I'm glad that we're doing some world building together. And one of the things that we're doing, we're building the superhero setting. We're going to go through the world building of that. And then we're going to write out some adventures set in this world. And we're going to connect them together into a campaign. So we're going to be building a story together that you'll be able to take anywhere you want to take uh, to show to your players, all that fun stuff. Oh, sorry, Tim. I'm glad you switched to YouTube. Um, yeah, uh, I, I want to keep these episodes at about an hour. So we'll be back again next Tuesday uh, from 5 p.m. EST to 6 p.m. EST to continue building our world here. In the meantime, I'd like you all to be thinking about what the six locations are where this took place. So let me actually share this Google Doc with all of you. I'll give you all comments ability so that you can leave comments in the document to uh you can leave comments in the document so that you can be we can be working together between events so i'll share a link to that now in chat in the meantime we'll be uh yeah we'll be building this together we're doing the highbrow world building stuff now and then we'll build down basically because i'm a top down kind of world builder when it comes to superhero games especially so with our deva tale we'll be starting with the high concept stuff who the devas are what their powers are and yeah when we um as you're leaving comments throughout the week please feel free to put in like i would like this to be one of the six locations with the mind that we want them to be one on each one on each of the populated continents in the world or if we really want to have Antarctica, we can figure it could be sort of like a thing situation in Antarctica where there were seven researchers who got empowered at the same time. And now they're they have a whole like standoff in the Arctic base, which gives a fun that gives a fun one shot adventure for sure. If we want to think about that. So as for news around Green Ronin uh, on Wednesday, tomorrow night, we'll be here at 8 p.m. EST over on the Patreon for our m, &M developer Q&A. Uh, Steve, Troy, and I will all be there, and we will be going into detail about the upcoming Valiant Kickstarter that was announced today. The Valiant Kickstarter goes live on January 16th. It is a new role-playing game set in the Valiant comic books universe using Mutants and Masterminds 3rd Edition as its adventure engine. So it'll be very familiar to anybody who's played m, &M 3, but it has a lot of fun new rules and new options, especially to simulate what I was talking about earlier with the deconstruction age of comic books. So if you want to play sort of that, that visceral, violent style gameplay where superheroes run into people and they explode into blood and gore, all that fun stuff, we have rules in store for that. We have iconic character stat blocks for over 80 of the Valiant characters. And just a fun of ton stuff coming with those books. Definitely check out the link for that. Sign up to be notified when the Kickstarter goes live because you're not going to want to miss this. We have a bunch of fun stuff. Uh, we have two books, the Valiant Adventures role-playing game and the Worlds of Valiant setting book. We're coming out with a new Game Master kit that's going to have a GM screen, which I know we've been out of stock of for a while. So even if you don't want the Valiant stuff, that could be a great way to get a new uh, GM screen. And we're coming up with some physical hero point tokens um, and... Some other fun props to bring to your table, like character folios, campaign journals, uh, play mats, all sorts of fun stuff. So it's going to be a great Kickstarter for people who are fans of Mutants and Mastermind and fans of Valiant Comics. And if you're both, great. Uh, we are still off of m, m Monday for the next two weeks for the holidays. But I'll be back here next Tuesday for the next Joy of Game Mastering at 5 p.m. EST. So until then... Thank you for hanging out with me tonight, and I hope to see you on the next one. Please keep game mastering.